only 2,700 years ago when these words of Isaiah were written, times were changing in the nation of Judah, that is, the nation of God's people, and things were not going towards the better. The once renowned kingdom of Israel had already been divided into what had become Israel and Judah, Judah being the smaller of the two kingdoms, and it had been under the reign of King Uzziah for some 52 years. In the Bible, King Uzziah is portrayed as a wonderfully intelligent and innovative king of Israel, under whom the nation of Judah prospered greatly and did some really well, really wonderful things and did really well during the time of King Uzziah. However, though, near the end of his reign, King Uzziah's pride and his uh, ego began to get in the way of his service to God and his leadership of the people, and he began to stumble. He began to do things that God would not have him to do, and it even led him to the point before his days were over that he committed the unfaithful act of exalting himself above the priests that God had established to make the sacrifices for the people at that time. Uzziah took it upon himself to take a sacrificial offering into the temple ahead of the job that the high priest should be doing. He exalted himself over them, made this sacrifice for uh, on his own, against the advice of all the priests and the people trying to get him to stop and to not commit this act. He did it anyways, and because of his behavior and disobedience, he was stricken with leprosy. He spent the rest of his days as an outcast, being a leper, dying alone there in a remote house in isolation, as was the fate of most lepers in those days. But this downward trend in the life of King Uzziah during those days is sort of reflective of the nation of Judah at that time as well. And we can see throughout the first few chapters of the book of Isaiah, if you read chapters 1 through 5, this trend of disobedience, this trend of irreverence towards God. The very same people that had been led out of bondage of Egypt by the hand of <coughs> Moses and the power of God and had overcome all they had in the wilderness in the days prior and all of the land of Canaan that they had taken, they seem to have forgotten their rich history of provision and deliverance from God. And we see in these first few chapters of Isaiah the downward trend that began to happen throughout this nation. And so I find it no coincidence here that we see this scene in Isaiah's life while all of this was going on. I think it's very fitting that it was such a time as this that Isaiah would be called by God to be that prophet, to go and preach to the people, to strive to turn their hearts back to, re to repentance and turning back towards the Lord because they have forgotten their place as human beings in relation to our Almighty God. And they had forgotten that gap of separation that exists between the holiness of God and us as human beings. And so Isaiah came along to try to remind these people of just how holy God was. But, you know, in this scene that we read before the prayer in verses 1 through 8 of Isaiah 6, out of all the details that we read by Isaiah, I think the overarching point, well, to me anyways, is that Isaiah had such a rare occurrence, a rare encounter to be in the physical manifestation or the physical presence of God Almighty himself. He says there in, in the beginning of the chapter, he says, I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne. And he points out the robe or the train that he wore, simply just a long robe-like garment that kings wore as they sat upon a throne. And he says it filled the entire temple in which he saw God residing in. And then we're presented with a picture of these angelic beings called seraphims. Now, to my knowledge, this is the only place in the scriptures that we can read about seraphims. And Isaiah describes them as having six wings. And he says, with two of them, they covered their face. And with two of them, they covered their feet. And two of them, with the, the final two, they flew around praising God. And they cry out aloud, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And when I read these words, I think of that old song we always sing, holy, holy, holy. And I think about the words, the cherubims and seraphims around the throne of God and those lyrics that we sing. And every time since we've studied this and we sing that song, my mind immediately starts trying to picture these seraphims and the smoke filling the temple there around the throne of God. And most of all, though, what I want to point out to us tonight 
Because I think it was probably at this point in Isaiah's life where more than ever before, he truly began to grasp the concept of the holiness of God. And as we'll study tonight, that's something that's hard for us as human beings to do, to wrap our minds around and to picture. But we see as this scene transpires and Isaiah begins to, he begins to worry about his condition and the sin in his life. He says, woe is me, I am undone. And he's fearful for his life because he's in the presence of God. And then all of a sudden he is saved by this seraphim that comes down with that live burning coal from the sacrificial altar. And he touches it to his lips and he purges Isaiah of his sins. And then he realizes that he is saved and that he is not in danger. And that he can stand before God. We see in these just, I don't know, but what I imagine is being just a few minutes there in Isaiah's life, a total transformation. He went from feeling completely doomed and completely hopeless to standing uprightly before God, justified, and being called to be a servant of God. And so I hope with this in mind you can see where our lesson and our study is going to go tonight. Although we today, being past the age of divine inspiration and miraculous intervention in our lives from God, we can experience the same physical encounter of seeing God sitting upon a throne that Isaiah did so long ago. However, I wonder how we would respond if we were given that same experience that Isaiah had today. How would our lives look different? I believe that's why Isaiah recorded these words in chapter 6 of his writings because he knew that people like you and I would be reading these words years on down the road and that there were things we could learn about God and His holiness that would help us in our lives and in our service to God. It would help us begin to grasp the concept of who He is, just how holy God is. We can learn a lot about the holiness of God from this chapter even today. And I hope through just a few minutes of studying these scriptures we can deny that it will help us realize just how undone, just how unworthy we are to be able to be in the presence of God. And it will hopefully prompt us to respond to God's calling the same way Isaiah did a long time ago. First of all, tonight I want to point out to, to you the glory of God. And that is what those seraphim said in Isaiah 6 and verse 3. They said, holy, 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 the whole is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. What a powerful statement that these seraphims speak there in the presence of Isaiah. And I think it's worth stopping here and not just going straight on through the chapter, but considering these words that they say here, I mean, after all, we've got angelic beings flying around. We've got Isaiah literally witnessing the presence of God. And I think about that. This whole scene was orchestrated by God himself for Isaiah. There was a purpose behind it. And this was a these are the first words of communication that Isaiah hears in this scene. Holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, this was a day and time, like we mentioned, where the people there of God, the people of Judah, had forgotten about what all God had done for them. A lot of them had turned around to these graven images and man-made statues and were worshiping them and, and worshiping idols. They were disobedient and irreverent towards God. The Bible even says that a lot of the people in that day and time still offered sacrifices to God. Like they would, they would go and do the routine. They would offer sacrifices to God. But Isaiah tells us throughout his book that God wouldn't accept them because of their hearts and because of the way they lived their lives. They were so disobedient that their sacrifices meant nothing to God. See, they had forgotten about who God was. And the first thing Isaiah hears... Holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of His glory. I think it's significant that God probably wanted Isaiah to remind the people every day about His presence throughout the world. And that is, how can we see God in the world around us today? I don't, I don't know what it is, and maybe I'm just telling on myself. Maybe it's just me and not all of you here tonight. I hope that's the case. But we get so busy in life, we just we get to run in the rat race. We go to work, go to school, do our jobs, come home, take care of the dog, all that good stuff. And not one <coughs> moment during that life that we do, every day, would we ever say, oh, no, we don't believe in God, or, oh, no, we're, we're a Christian. We would never not admit our faith in Jesus. 
and God the Father is our King, but do we often stop and think about how the earth declares the glory of God? For me, it's times like what Emma and I have done over the last year. We've been fortunate enough to be able to take a couple of really cool trips. We were out at Glacier National Park in Montana. And then more recently, we were in Yosemite National Park out in California. And one morning, we got up before daylight, and we went up in, there in Yosemite to Tunnel View. Some of you have probably been there. And we watched the sun come up down there between Half Dome and, and El Capitan. We come up right through the crevice there and rise and got some just beautiful photos of it. But for me, it's those moments where I think about Isaiah 6 and verse 3. The whole earth is full of the glory of God. I think about David in Psalm 19 and verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork therein. It's times like that I slow down and I stop and think about how we can plant little seeds in the ground and get fields full of crops that bring forth fruit and trees as tall as skyscrapers. I think about plants that produce oxygen so we can breathe it in and then give carbon dioxide back to them so they can just keep the process going. And I think, how does all of this work? I'm an outdoorsman and I get out in nature and I watch deer and turkey go feeding around these fields and these plants we're talking about. And I watch their little ones come out and I watch them hover over them and protect them. And I think, how do they know to do that? They're not humans. Who put that nature inside of them? I think about how all these bodies work and how I'm so lucky to wake up every single morning and, you know, so I know there's some really fancy technology out here in the world today, but so far I'm lucky enough I don't have any of that. My heart just keeps beating without me telling it to. And I tell you, I'm very thankful for that. I don't know how and I don't know why. I don't know how this brain is programmed to make it do that, but it just does it. And, you know, the most fascinating, fascinating thing to me is when I study life and all of these incredible things in our earth around us, is the smallest part that makes it all go around, and that's the cells in your body. You know, people tell me that there's trillions of cells in a human body. And I was never a biology whiz growing up, but we would look at these cells under microscopes and study all the different parts of them. And, you know, there's just all kinds of processes going on, not within your body, but within just one cell. And the thing that's telling all these processes to go on and to happen so that you can keep living is called DNA. Now, I'm, I think I know what DNA stands for. I'm not going to try to pronounce it to you tonight. don't want to make you all feel bad. But you know, DNA can be written, scientists tell me, as just a four-letter alphabet. But it acts as like a computer code that you can write out these four letters, A, T, G, and C, over and over in so many different orders. And you know, that's what makes you you. It's a program inside of one cell, and these trillions of cells multiply to form you. And you know, there's three funny things about DNA. They say, first of all, that there's no two people in the world with the same DNA. And I said, oh, they forgot about identical twins. And so I looked that up. And they said, no, even identical twins have little genetic mutations that make them unique. And I said, that's impossible. How many people are there in the world? And it said there's like 7 billion people in the world. And I think none of these people have the same DNA out of all of them? No, they don't. But you know, the second most amazing thing about that to me is not only are there no two people with the same DNA, but you know, that order of those letters that make you you, scientists have no idea how that order gets there. Or should I say atheistic scientists have no idea how that order gets there. They study it. They can tell you what that order is. They can study that order and they can tell you if you're going to have brown hair, red hair. And they can't tell you if you're going to have green or blue hair, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> they can tell you how tall you're going to be. They're going to tell you if you're going to be mean or nice like your mama or your daddy. They can tell you what all these codes mean, but they cannot tell you how that, what it is scientifically that puts them in that order. 
Other than it's just random. That's amazing to me that as smart as we are as human beings today, we can't figure that out. But finally, about DNA, what blows people's minds is that they can't create it without having some already. They've got to have some existing to make more of it. They've tried and they failed. They said, we can't make life without having life already. And that's where God comes in, you see. People tell me, oh, I don't believe in creation. I believe in evolution. Well, that's cool. What did you evolve from and where did it come from? And people say, oh, I don't believe in the Genesis creation. I believe in a Big Bang Theory. Well, that's good, too. I, you might have taught me into believing in the Big Bang Theory. Do you know why? Because what is it that Big Bang, con, what did it consist of? Where did it come from? Oh, you see where I'm going with this? To be an atheist today, or to believe in something other than God, you have to believe that something comes from nothing. You have to look at all these intricate processes in the world around us today, and you have to believe that it all came from nothing. Without a creator, where does it come from? You have to believe without God that something comes from nothing. And so, most of you here tonight probably believe all this. I'm just telling you stuff that you probably already know. And believe or you probably wouldn't even be here if you didn't believe in God. So what's my point? My point is to stop and think about these things from time to time. Watch the sun come up every morning, or at least once a week. And I want you to think about how the earth is tilted on that 23 and a half degree axis. And if it was tilted a little further the other way, it'd be too hot for you to survive. Or if it was tilted a little further the opposite way, it'd be too cold for you to survive. And think about all the intricate details in the world around you today. And think, there is a God controlling all of these things and all 7 million people living around it at the same time. I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know, i got friends who can't even walk and chew gum at the same time. And there is a God in heaven above who created all these things and cares about you and me. The whole earth is full of the glory of God. And I'm going to tell you today, if we don't stop and think about this and realize it from time to time, we'll become all those people you know. We'll offer sacrifices, metaphorically. We'll come to worship. We'll do the things we read. But we'll slowly grow more and more distant from God because we'll forget just how massive of a being He is, how powerful and mighty and holy He is. Holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of His glory. But secondly, I want us to know the reasons these seraphims proclaim so boldly that the whole earth is full of God's glory. And that is because they wanted Isaiah to stop and truly recognize the holiness of God. If you haven't figured it out by now, that's what this whole sermon is about, is the holiness of God. And I take us to this scene from Isaiah tonight because coupled with my human inability and my lack of feeble words to explain this to you tonight is just simply the fact that it's, it's hard to put into words who God is, how holy He is. And so I take you to this scene tonight to try to just point you to the Scriptures, to allow you to put yourself in Isaiah's shoes to realize it for yourself and not depend on my poor description of it tonight. In a very generic sense, we've scratched the surface of how remarkable God's power is in His creation and the earth around us that he demonstrates to us. It's no wonder Paul said in Romans 1 and verse 20 that his creation makes everything about him known, that uh, the invisible things are known through his creation and that those who do not believe in him are without excuse because he has made his power known. But yet I think when we stop tonight and we place ourselves into the trembling shoes of Isaiah in Isaiah 6, that we can somehow 
at least start to begin to realize the holiness of God. And what I sometimes call, I've heard other people call it this, the otherness of God. That is just how different He is from you as a human being. And that He is on a level that we can't hardly comprehend. His love, His power, His wisdom, His might, all of these things are just hard for our feeble brains to comprehend. But we see there in verse, uh, well, in verse 3, as we've already read, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And it says, in the post of the door, move at the sound of him that cried. And the house was filled with smokes. And Isaiah sitting there, I imagine, with his jaw dropped to the floor and his eyes probably big and bug-eyed, wondering what was going to happen to him and how he was physically looking at God that day. And it reminded me immediately of a scene we read about in the book of Exodus. Over in Exodus chapter 3, we read about Moses having a similar encounter where he was in the presence of God that day in a burning bush. It says in Exodus 3 and verse 1, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert, and he came to the mountain of God even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, was the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? We'll talk more about that in our conclusion. And God said, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where all thou standest is holy ground. Holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. See what Moses did. It says, And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. I'm sorry to tell you today that in the religious world that we live in, this is not something I see all too often anymore. And I'm not talking about anybody specific tonight or any specific denomination. I'm just talking about in a general sense of what we know and hear of as Christianity. This attitude of Isaiah and his fear and trembling. And this attitude that Moses had being in the presence of God. Of hiding his face and fear after recognizing that he was on holy ground is not something I see. And you know, it brings us to the point tonight. Why was that holy ground that Moses was on there when he saw that burning bush? Was it something special about that desert there at Mount Horeb where he was? The only thing special about it that made that ground holy is because he was in the presence of God. You know, I see people today who view God as nothing more than like a great big grandpa in the sky. They talk about him like he thinks everything they do is cute. All their little rebellious acts are funny to him, and he just laughs them off and brushes them aside because he loves them. I heard one brother put it like, it seems like God has become like a cosmic vending machine in the sky. They just give everybody whatever worldly thing they ask for. They're just... Wait for that new Jeep or that big house or that perfect dog out there that they're waiting for. And it's all just a gift from God. And it's just straight from Him because He just wants them to be happy with all of these worldly things. And that's, that's the way a lot of the world views God today. Like I said, it's more, so, more of a great grandpa in the sky instead of the holy king and lord of hosts. You know, I, I think about this attitude towards God, and I ask the question to all of us here tonight, have we ever approached God casually in our spiritual lives? Have we ever viewed God 
in a casual manner. I ask it to you this way. Do you think Moses or Isaiah would approve of the way a lot of people in this day and time view God and approach Him and talk about Him? Not hard. And you say, well, Landon, what are you talking about? I mean, most Christians I know are you know what I mean? They, they know who God is. And they view him for what he is. Well, I see this casual approach we're talking about towards God show up in various ways. First of all, I think you can see it show up sometimes in our prayers. You know those older brethren who've been through a lot in their lives? Those older sisters? Sometimes as we say, they've seen it all. And you hear them pray, whether it be in the worship service or at home. And you hear the humility in their voice. And you hear how reliant they are upon God because they know how much they need Him. They know how undone they are without Him. Think about that. And then think about the people you hear prancing around the stage today. Father God this, Father God that, and Father God just, <laughs> man, bear with me, God. I just, you know, I, you know what I'm talking about. You hear that attitude in prayers. I'm notorious for this back home, and I get railed on quite a bit for it back in my home congregation, so if y'all talk about me, just do it behind my back, and it's fine. But I'm going to give you some homework. I... I do this a lot back home, like I said. But I want you to go home tonight or next week sometime. I want you to read John chapter 17. We're not going to read the whole thing here tonight because I think you probably do it better. Read it by yourself at home somewhere quiet. But I want you to read that prayer of Jesus with his impending death and agony approaching in his life and how he approached the Father. And I want you to hear the humility and the reverence in his voice as he prayed. And then I want you to ask yourself, do you approach God in that manner, recognizing his holy as he is? Don't forget, as Hebrews 4 and 16 says, we can boldly approach God's throne of grace in time of need. Absolutely. I'm not telling you you can never boldly approach the throne of God. But I'm asking you to consider how you do it with humility and reverence. What about when we come to the church house? What about our worship? Do we ask ourselves, how are we worshiping God? Do we worship God the way He's asked us to worship in the Scriptures? Do we worship God in spirit and in truth as we are commanded to do in the Scriptures? Or do we take it upon ourselves and say, you know, God, He doesn't care if we do this in our worship. I mean, He just wants us to be sincere and have a good time. It's no big deal if we incorporate some foreign concept into our worship that the New Testament church never did in their days because this is the 21st century and, I mean, God wants you to get with the times. Think Isaiah. After what happened to him, do you think Isaiah would have that attitude? What about what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. He said, Know you not that you, talking to the church there at Corinth, that you being the church are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. There's that word again. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple ye are? He says, when you come to worship with the church, I want you to realize that even here, this very occasion tonight, that you're in the presence of God. The church is the temple of God. And he says, that temple is holy. Which temple ye are? Are you holy? Tonight, what about preparing to come to be 
in the presence of God. And I know people say today, well, God's everywhere. You're always in the presence of God. And that's true. But in this specific sense, we are taught that the church is the temple of God where His presence is at. Do you think about that before you come to worship services? Now, I'm not telling people that there's any kind of dress code tonight. But do you think about how you look before you come to be? We can say come to worship, or in other words, come to be in the presence of God. You just, ah, oh, it doesn't matter if I spill mustard all over my shirt. Well, I don't care about that. Let me just roll on into church anyways. You think not? I'm going to be in the presence of God. I'm going to look sharp. I'm going to give off my best image simply because I want God to know that I revere Him. What about your mind during worship services? What about when we gather around the Lord's table on the first day of each week as the Bible teaches us to do? Do you set aside all worldly things at that point in time and do you focus on what Jesus did for you so long ago upon the cross? You know, He commands us to do that. He says, this do in remembrance of me. Do we let our minds wander? What about when we're singing these songs? Do we just look at those notes and sing them and kind of grumble every time verse uh, brother says, let's lead all three verses because the song is going to take longer? Or do we meditate upon those songs and hymns and spiritual songs with grace in our hearts and thanksgiving to God for what they mean and the salvation that we sing about? What about when our brother's praying and leading the main prayer and worship? Are we over here thinking about that milkshake we're going to get after church? Or are we uttering those words with him in prayer that he's offering on our behalf? Because we're talking to God. You see how you can, your mind can slowly start to forget about the holiness of God? What about your lifestyle? your hobbies, your conversation, the people you go and hang out with and do things with, your attitude towards God and your example towards them. Do you remember that you are a part of the temple of God and that temple is holy? I hear people all the time today with this casual attitude towards God we're talking about. And they say, man, I just... I just love what God is doing in this person's life. He did this, and he gave them that. And the biggest one I hear today is, oh, that's just a God wink. God sent me that. God told me this wasn't right, or God gave me this sign that I shouldn't do this, that, or the other. Don't get me wrong here. I'm not making fun of sincere people. That's not my intention here. What I want you to see tonight is the audacity of us as a human being to think that we are on the same level of knowing the mind of God without any miraculous revelation other than what he's told us in his scriptures that we can read and know. The audacity of a lot of us today when we claim to know the mind of God. Now, Moses and Isaiah have a lot of inspiration. But do you think if you, uninspired Landon or Emma or anybody else here tonight, had the same encounter that Isaiah had, that you would approach God the same way you do today? That's a question we all need to ask tonight. Do we remember what Peter said in 1 Peter 1, verse 15 through 16, where he said, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Isaiah 6 and verse 5, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, 
which he had taken with tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Isaiah said, Woe is me. That word woe there in its original language indicates a passionate cry of grief and despair. He says, I am undone. Or in other words, that word literally means I am ruined. It means I am destroyed. It means I cease to exist. Woe is me, for I am ruined. Why? Because I am a man of unclean lips. He has sin in his life. He's unclean. And it took all of about one second of being in the presence of God for him to realize that sin in his life was going to cause him to be ruined. Now, I can't, I wish I could tonight. I wish I could get it through my own thick-headed self sometimes, but I can't. But I'm asking you tonight to take yourself back to Isaiah's shoes and feel what he felt. Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips. I am a people, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Do you see, or at least kind of see, how he felt? One second in the presence of God, he was hopeless. He said, I am ruined. I am despaired. He was undone. He realized in a way stronger than any of us ever will, this side of death, that sin cannot be in the presence of God. Then put one of the seraphims unto him with that live coal. It was a burning coal. Some people call it a cauterizing coal. It was hot. It was glowing red. It said the seraphim had to use tongs to take it off the altar. And that's something if even a seraphim couldn't touch it. It was hot. He touched it to the lips of Isaiah. He said, Your sins have been purged. That altar there, you know what that altar where those glowing hot coals were, what that represents? An altar was where the people back in those days went to offer sacrifices. They would take these lambs and they would slay them upon an altar as an atonement for sin. That seraphim grabbed that burning coal from an altar. You know what that means? That means that something had to be sacrificed for Isaiah to be purged. Something had to die so that he could live. You know where this is going by now, don't you? And I want to tell you today that just like Isaiah could not stand before God without that sacrifice being made on his behalf and purging him of his sins, none of us have a chance in the presence of God one day without a sacrificial lamb of atonement for our souls. I've thought about this and I've tried to go along with it as much as possible, but I'm to the point where I, if you don't if you don't finish this statement, I just can't go along with it anymore. But you've heard the statement throughout the religious world today, oh come to our church, just come as you are. We'll take anybody. Come as you are, they say. I, I can't stop it. It's just that. Because you cannot come as you are. You cannot come as Isaiah was to be in the presence of God. And let me finish that statement. Like I said, you can come as you are, but you can't stay as you are. You cannot do that. Moses had to take his shoes off because he was on holy ground. Isaiah had to have that live coal pressed to his lips to purge him of his sins because he was undone. He was destroyed without it. I submit to you tonight that without the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing you from your sins, you will be lost. You will stand before God one day in his presence just like Isaiah did and you will be undone for all of eternity without the live coal, so to speak, of Jesus' blood cleansing you 
from your sins. Romans 5, verse 8 and 9 says, But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, like Isaiah, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified, how? By his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him. Told in Acts 22 and verse 16 where the Apostle Paul was told to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins. Call him on the name of Jesus. Isaiah even foretold about this later on in his book in chapter 53. He said, surely he has borne our griefs and kicked griefs and carried our sorrows. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, dumb before his shears, but he opened not his mouth. And then what does he say? He was stricken. He was bruised. And he says, by his stripes we are healed. Prophesying about Jesus that a sacrifice had to be made on our behalf. And you know, this is the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It does the same thing for us today that that cauterizing cold did for Isaiah in the presence of God so long ago. It changes us. It changes our allegiance from this world to King Jesus. It changes our allegiance and our thoughts and our motives and our lust from sin and selfishness to righteousness and purity and eternal things. I'll just be honest with you tonight. I don't know about you. There's been times, even in my Christian life, where I felt like Isaiah did. Took a step back and looked at my own life. You know what I said? I said, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I've been around a lot of people with unclean lips. But you know, that's what the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ is. His blood, once applied to our souls, can flow throughout a lifetime through repentance and confession and prayers to God. As a Christian, we can retain, obtain forgiveness of our sins and be restored back to his fold. I wonder if you've ever felt like Isaiah tonight. I heard Joe Hassel say down at Early Town, Alabama last week. He said, you know, a lot of times people will kind of gig me or make fun of me for preaching a lot of first principles. And the first principles of Christianity and kind of belaboring those points everywhere I go. He said, but you know what the first principles of this book do? He said, it's the greatest book in the whole world because it's the only thing that can take an evil, wretched, wicked sinner <coughs> and turn them into a child of God. Think about that. Think about the God we've talked about tonight. You can be a child of His. The Bible says you can be a joint heir with Jesus Christ through obedience to His gospel. John the Baptist beheld Jesus, saw Him coming in John 1 verse 29 and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus Himself said in John 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We're told in Acts 3 and verse 19 to repent, therefore, to be converted so that your sins may be blotted out, like Isaiah's were purged. Jesus said in Matthew 10 and verse 32, If you confess me before me, and him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. As we read in Acts 22 and verse 16, and we can also read in 1 Peter 3 and 21, that is, is that figure of baptism. That is the picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that we obey in that watery grave where our sins are washed away, where we rise to walk in newness of life. Jesus said in Mark 16 and 16, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be damned. 
are so thankful tonight that just like by no merit of his own, Isaiah was saved from that sacrificial atonement by that live and burning coal. That by nothing I've done or deserved tonight, God has given me a way of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, for all who would obey his gospel. And finally, in chapter 6 and verse 8 of Isaiah, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. You know, this experience certainly warranted a response from Isaiah. Could you imagine at that time, after all that had taken place there and what had been done, if God asked that question, who can I use? Who will go for us? And Isaiah looked around and said, anybody else want to go? I'm not really feeling it. He said, here am I. Send me. Moses said, here I am, Lord. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9 when he was Saul of Tarsus going to drag Christians to their death. And he met Jesus and had a similar encounter on the Damascus Road. And he realized that Jesus was the Lord, the Son of God, and that he was a sinner and that he was undone. And he asked Jesus, he said, what would you have me do, Lord? What a response. Those on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 there in verse 37 where they were pricked in their hearts of the guilt of their sin and they realized that they were undone, that they were guilty. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? The call to Isaiah certainly had a response because he had just gone from facing certain destruction in the presence of God to being graciously saved by that sacrifice and no merit of his own. You know, the gospel of Jesus Christ calls us to become servants of him and his kingdom, with him as our king. He is the king of kings and lord of lords, Revelation 19 and 16 says, and he is seated at the right hand of God with all authority, rule, and power, according to Ephesians 1, verse 20 and 21. And he has made us a kingdom. And he's freed us from our own sins by his own blood. Revelation 1, verses 5 and 6. And so I ask you once more as we close our lesson tonight, if we had the same experience as Isaiah today, tonight, to be in the presence of God, we saw this train fill the temple and the smoke billows rise and the doorpost at this church house began to shake and tremble at the voice of those seraphims crying out to God. And then you were saved from destruction. I want to say that's a picture of what happens after you've obeyed the gospel tonight. So I ask you, what would your response be? Would it change your lifestyle? Your morals? Your character? The things you think about at home in your room when you're by yourself? Your prayer life? Would it motivate your personal evangelism more? Would it change your Bible study habits if you were able to walk away from that scene? Justified and saved from certain doom and destruction? Would you have stronger faith? Would you pay more attention to what the Bible says? Here's one. If you were in that scene of Isaiah so long ago and you were saved and able to walk away from it, would you still hold on to that old saying that you don't have to be baptized? It's just good if you are. I have a feeling people would look at Acts 2 and 38 a whole lot different when it comes to baptism if they were lucky enough to walk away like Isaiah would. You, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is their attention to God's Word, their reverence for what He said because He is holy and we are not. If they could have that experience in their life, how would they respond? How would you respond tonight? I want to tell you that the day is coming where we will all be in the presence of God one day. I want you to think about that each and every day. I want you to think about tonight before you go to bed that there is a day coming where you 
will be just like Isaiah was. And you'll be in the presence of Almighty God. Philippians 2 and 10 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Will you dwell justified in the presence of God one day in those jasper walls inside those pearly gates with those streets of gold surrounded with all those others whose robes have been washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb for all of eternity? Or will you tremble and be undone in agonizing despair because of lack of reverence to God and His Word when you come into His presence. It's a powerful scene when we think about it tonight. The holiness of God and our attitude towards Him, towards our worship, towards our Christian lives. And I hope when you read this scene from Isaiah chapter 6 going forward, you'll put yourself in His shoes and think about these things and strive to be the holy part of His kingdom calls us to be. For be ye holy, for I am holy. I'm ready to draw the lesson to a close and offer the invitation tonight. If there's one here who is not a Christian, we certainly want you to become one tonight. It's part of the reason we hold this meeting. We want to strengthen those who are Christians and give words of encouragement and edification, but we also want to extend the gospel invitation to those who have never obeyed it. If you're here tonight and you've never become a Christian, once you do that tonight, you can follow these steps with outline and obedience. Come believing in Jesus as the Son of God. Be willing to repent of your past sins, to have that change of heart that leads to a change in your lifestyle. Confess His name before those here that, yes, you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, creator of this world, all that we talked about here tonight. And last, but certainly not least, as His word instructs you to be baptized in water for the remission of your sins. You can have your sins washed away. And you can rise to walk in newness of life, as the Bible teaches us. And then you can dedicate your allegiance to Jesus as your king. You can serve him faithfully all the days of your life. And then when we stand before God one day in his presence in the judgment, we can enter into that heavenly home. Many of us here tonight have done this, but at times we stray away from the Lord. We lose our reverence towards Him. We fall into sin. Why not make that right tonight? You can go to God in prayer and ask Him to forgive you and repent of that sin and He will forgive you. You can also come forward tonight and make that known at the end of this invitation song and ask for the prayers of your brothers and sisters for forgiveness of that sin. And we'll be glad to pray with you for you as well. To be one in either case, come as we stand and sing.